I'm not a, I'm not an industrial animator. I'm not a commercial animator. I, I think I, I come at animation from a very strange angle because, again, coming from the fine arts, um, and the, you, you think of the history of painting in the 20th century, you know, there's been this terrible, incredible revolutions in, in how people make paintings. And, you know, discussing what is a painting? Is it just paint on canvas? That kind of thing. So I, I've... I've always liked when I approach movie making, and I'm sure it drives some people crazy, is I like to acknowledge that it's a fake, that it's just paint, that it's not, you're not 100% there, you're kind of there, but you're not 100%. So there's kind of like a, an engagement with the, what's going on on the screen, but also you can see what it's made of. There's a disengagement. And I find that, that really interesting. A part of what I ask myself at the beginning of every project is what is the experience I want to go on? Okay. Sometimes that's a really heavy duty narrative. Sometimes that's abstract. Sometimes that's kind of abstract. In Tara's dream, it was like a meditation on time, on time passing and what we do, like all these little simple things, not flying, but, you know, but, but drink, you know, like the cat, watching the cat, looking the cat on the ledge and, you know, drinking, uh, having soup, you know, and it just seemed like a, a meditation. So I started to layer it and put like, um, f it ended up being five of the same sequence, five shots of the same sequence layered on top, a little out of sync, a little indifferent. They're never slower or faster. They're just not at the, in the same time. So it starts to become, for me, this meditation on time. It's almost like um, the quality of a haiku or a, a piece of poetry. And it was funny because <laughs> I, uh, I was just making this. I wasn't even sure it was a movie. And, 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 and then uh, someone asked me to uh, enter it in the Toronto Urban Film Festival, which was, is a, a festival that occurs at the same time as the TIFF Festival here in Toronto. But they show it on the TTC screens. And I thought, well, I don't really have anything. It had to be a minute, and it had to be silent. And it just happened that <laughs> Tara's dream was just about a minute. If I put the end credits on, it'd be a minute. And I didn't even know it was a movie. <laughs> you know? So I, you know, it was just like this little meditative piece, meditative piece to me. So I ended up submitting it, and, and I thought, oh, well, they're never going to take this. But you know, they'll never accept this. So I sent it in. And it ended up winning two prizes. And I just went into shock. It was just like, what? You know, like, because you know, this was a film that I had not pre-strategized, pre-boarded, pre-anything. I just started and started making it. And then, okay, fine, and whatever. And then, um, so it's funny, the creative process, because sometimes you don't even know you're making a movie. You think you're making a set of experiments. And then at the end, I had um, the, Paul Inston, my, the musician, the composer who does my, my pieces, uh, do a really nice kind of soundtrack. But that was after the fact, totally. After the Tough Festival, because it had, there was no sound. So, and I think of it as something I can present in an art gallery, too, because it has like a loop, like a loop structure, as a lot of my films do. But even if you look at Labyrinth or Sorceress, they return, whether it's to, you know, someone where they started on the journey or time, you start the film off at the end of the film, but you don't know it's the end. And it comes back to that in the case of Labyrinth, you know. So um, so anyway, that, that's Tara's dream. I, I went to, to art school to study, uh, you know, visual arts, painting and drawing, and that's what I thought I was going to be. And then, but I also, when I was younger in high school, I used to uh, go to see movies all the time. It was a big love, I love, love movies. Friday night, I would go to see one film and I would watch both shows, the seven o'clock and the nine o'clock show. So I'd watch it first time to, to enjoy them and the second time to figure out how they were done. Because back in those days, there were no books on how you made movies. And then, so I guess I was a film buff or a fil really interested in film, even from when I was in high school. And I guess when I started to think about what do I like about paint on glass animation is that it marries the two things, the visual arts and movie making into one way of doing things. And I can also do it just myself. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's what I like about animation is I can just do it myself. It's a private experience of me and the, and the filmmaking. And uh, I, I think what I'm very pleased with in the last, uh, say, eight years of working is that I found out ways to get all of the kind of things I'm interested in. Like, what is the meaning of life? You know, and, and, but also these experimental notions. 
So it's it's there's there's narrative, but there's also experimentation. There's meaning, but sometimes there's just puzzlement. I don't know what this means, like Tara. I just I just I just did it. I, I enjoy it, and it's meditative. And I think I think it's something that maybe is more. I don't want to put this on poetry, but maybe more like a poet would just write something, and it's it's a phenomena that you you're you're meditating on. You know, and it doesn't make sense in a in a in a rational way. But I I, I do want my filmmaking to be about like the pleasure that I felt when I first experienced cinema. You know, that we we don't go there because we have to go. You know, like, you know, or we should go because it's good for us. We go to films because we are so enthusiastic. We like them and everybody should be a pre going to art, reading, whatever, because they want to do it, you know, and that's the kind of thing. So I think sometimes what makes animation seem a little silly beyond that there are a lot of silly animated films is that animators have a very great sense of humor. Even when we're doing something serious it's got a sense of humor because we know it's a fake. We know it's something we just drew. We it doesn't ex, doesn't really exist, you know. So that's there's a like if there's an irony, there's an irony there for me. It's it's a total fake, but we believe it, and we want to be pulled into that fake, you know. So I think that animation it's it's interesting to try to do something <laughs> something serious with animation because I think. The whole art form tends to be not so much about that. It tends to be about the laughs and the, and that's all great. Don't get me wrong. But you know, I think it, it when you hear somebody doing something serious in animation, you think, oh, you know, <laughs> something's not right there. <laughs> Being an artist in Canada, it's 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 a funny thing because art is not to me central no, people are just gonna go nuts when they hear this but art to me is not central to people's lives i think artists i think art art is a really complicated place to be as an artist you feel like this outsider and you know people think well dirty art dirty artist doesn't work you know like you know i can't make a living you know and and it's 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 all very peculiar it's like you, you want to do something but we don't have a highly developed uh, art market in canada as we were talking about earlier and so it's very hard to make a living it's it's it become exceptionally hard to make a living even f with films because of the uh, you know the internet and all kinds of new ways of People are looking at films and stealing films, you know, and, you know, but, but not to blame all that, but it's always been hard for an independent artist to kind of make art and get it shown. And um, I, I don't know that that's a unique experience to Canada. All I know is this is where I was born and this is what I'm dealing with. I mean, you know, I, a lot of my films are shown around the world at film festivals. So it's funny and I really enjoy that getting, <laughs> getting the work out beyond Canada and uh, um, but I don't know if that answers the question you know I know for myself all I all I worry about right now is getting work made Be, and also that it's it's an exploration it's a personal exploration I do pe want people to like the films I do want people to enjoy the films but it is as equally a personal exploration that I've got a that's what gets me through it it certainly isn't money you know because there isn't that much money but uh, but like I say I, I think for me it was discovering that somehow I could make narratives but they could also have this artistic aspect that for me was the real key that opened the door because I was battling that whole issue because I love storytelling but I love odd things i'm not gonna say weird i'm not gonna say odd things <laughs> or the different things in life you know yeah um no i think the way i've survived it is just to learn how to live really cheaply you know and do things in a very modest way are those maybe those aren't the strategies for everybody i mean you know i can certainly see we're thinking big and going big and doing everything big has worked very well for some people. But for me, I, I, I guess I like just the very intimate act of 
working on my own. I don't want to coordinate. I shot a live action one film one time and it was like a nightmare. It's like a soap opera because, you know, it's <laughs> like there's so many people unhappy on the set, you know, and it's just not, it, it was hard to concentrate on the filmmaking, you know. <laughs> yeah, so I, I like the, I, I like just, just um, doing it myself and at the end, you know, coordinating voice actors, you know, to do the sounds, you know, so it's much more contained. Yeah, it's a difficult question, this issue of being an artist in Canada. I think you really have to know why you're doing it, because that may be what gets you through it. Well, I think with a still painting, what you, with a painting, you're trying to find a really interesting image that people can meditate on. They can go over the surface and think, okay, what does this have to do with this? And look at all the parts and the so it's a very different thing. It's almost like a map, you know, it's, that someone's looking over, over top of. Whereas a movie, you're, it's really about motion and narrative and, you know, uh, you know it, it's a totally different experience. It's something like it's a simulation of life. And I guess that's what I find interesting about it, is it all of a sudden now the painting's alive. <laughs> I'm not a person necessarily who needs the painting to come alive because I can spend time in museums and totally enjoy a painting as it is. But I think that's what attracted me to paint on glass was that you could make the painting come to life. I still find visual arts like still paintings wonderful. And I think that, that like the novel, like all these things that are supposed to be out of date, they, you know, they're still very valid uh, fine art, experience, art experiences. And it's not like I want to turn everything into a movie, you know, but and especially with something like animation, like you've really got to want to make that a move to stay with it long enough to <laughs> make it come alive. Because, you know, you're in my case, you're doing like 12 paintings a second or altering a painting over and over again to make 12 frames a, a second. So, you know, you, you know, it can take me a year to make a nine minute film. So, you know, it's got somehow the bringing it to life has really got to matter. I've really got to want that. I think the tendency, especially with 3D computer animation, is that we have this world that we, we're almost like creating, <laughs> in 3D computer animation, it's almost like simulating live action filmmaking to the point where it's actually going to look, you see every little leaf on a tree and all this other stuff. And, and I, I'm kind of very consciously against that approach. <laughs> I, I, I don't I don't like it all to be there. I like it like, in fact, when I, when I started to work with paint on glass, I, I actually intended to be much rougher than it turned out. And what I wanted it to be, uh, my approach to Painted Blast was to, was to make a black void on which the actual imagery uh, was painted in white. So you actually had to fill in a lot of the image as a viewer, right? It wasn't all there, every little, you know, uh, you say it was wallpaper. You know, the, all the wallpaper wasn't there, all the lighting wasn't there, all the details and everything. So... For some reason, I find that much more interesting where the audience has to fill in things and imagine what the rest of it looks like. Labyrinth and Sorceress, for me, are really grand narratives. Like they're, they're, I think of them as feature films collapsed down to like eight and a half to nine minutes. And that goes back to that love of when I would go to those movies in high school and see films like The French Connection and The, uh, and the Godfather films, you know, and just this fantastic narratives. So it's it, while I did enjoy animation as a kid, you know, like Warner Brothers and Rocky and Bullwinkle and Popeye, it wasn't like I would, when I think of the kinds of things I'm doing now, it's actually live action filmmaking that informs it. You know, they're, 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 they're not spoofs on narratives, they're narratives. You know, I really like that idea of like, like, you know, it's like, it's like the thousand and one nights. It's like, you're going to tell a story, you're going to drag people right into it. And that's, that's, there's no irony to it. I want you to come right in and see the story, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, so that, that's something that I think is really important to understand is that my, my references are more live action. One of the problems with experimental or kind of slightly challenging filmmaking is, is to get the audience on your side. But if you start off and you said, oh, it's a detective story, everybody go, oh, it's a detective story. And they go right into it with you because we're so used to the the genre of film noir. We know all the things like, you know, everything down to the Venetian blinds and the femme fatale and the guy in the trench coat. So I thought, well, this is great. If I, if I started off as a film noir, everybody will say, oh, it's a film noir. 
But what I wanted to do was tell a story about a detective that couldn't figure out what was going on. So, and I, and it, and it go, I think it goes to a larger kind of metaphor or, or thing that happens in our lives where we sometimes we don't know what the right decision is to make. Like he goes through the film, he wants to help this woman who's, who's being pursued by these other guys. And he kind of doesn't know if she, he should trust her or not. That's, that's a whole film noir thing. And he goes and he just, it just gets weirder and weirder. Right. And that's the idea is that he's kind of lost in the story, which is why I called it Labyrinth. And then when it comes to Sorceress, well, Sorceress uh, is uh, Sorceress, which is the second film. It's actually, I think of it as a trilogy. Uh, there's another film yet to be made. Uh, with Sorceress, it was, it was the follow-up to Labyrinth. But it's funny, the way I, start, I work when I evolve my films is it's not from a narrative. It's from a set of images. So in, in the case of Labyrinth, there was a, a shadow figure in a hallway. And that was the first one. And then the second image was a diner in the desert at night. Just one of these, you know, little diners. <laughs> but I had these two images. After all, I start with images because I'm a, I've come from the visual arts. I don't, I'm not a writer primarily. So I don't sit down and say, okay, it's going to be about this detective. Yeah, right. And it's going to be, a... <laughs> no, to, to me, it starts from intriguing images. And then I slowly start to build, like, what does a diner have to do with a, a, a shadow figure in a hallway? And then gradually it starts to just build from that. It's a very painful process because, you know, I, I'm just sort of trying like, like, and I'm also trying to make a film that is, is very unique. It's not a narrative, a normal narrative, but it's got the trappings of a normal narrative. So what will happen is I'll, I'll start to play with the images and put them on the storyboard. And mainly it's board, it's storyboarded. It's not, it's not a writing process. It's, it's a storyboarding process. So the visual is really important to me. But I'll be going along, and then the story gets too normal. And I think, oh, no, no. And okay, <laughs> start again. Like, or not, you know, that adds something, throw in another curveball. And it's all trial and error until it all comes together. But in, in a Labyrinth, it was especially interesting because it was, a I think, a very poetic film. You know, that it's not all about, it doesn't make, you know, it doesn't make sense in a kind of, you know, rational way. It's a very, very poetic film. And even right towards the end, I know I, I right as I finished shooting, I actually changed the ending slightly and had the, the image of the birds flying in the hallway. Uh, that actually was originally intended to be a little bit earlier in the film. And it, and, but I, I didn't, I, I cut out a bit, a little, a little shot, uh, scene and then I had, but I still had the birds. And so when the, when the angel flies off with <laughs> the detective's soul into the heavens you know afterwards i just thought well to end the film we'll just have the birds flapping in the hallway you know just as a poetic moment to, to a period on the on the piece right and uh well sorceress so when, when i came to something like sorceress again it was the same process it, it wasn't like I, I go in there saying oh i've got a and in fact a lot of times with my filmmaking i try to go on a different journey in every film you know so I didn't necessarily want to do a film noir again, but I wanted to explore that same world of, of, of Labyrinth, the same area, uh, you know, sort of country it exists in or world. And, um, and, but for some reason I had this drawing I had made of a girl huddled in a doorway at night in a city. And then I drew another girl and these are just doodles, you know, sketches. And there's another girl in kind of rags and she, she was long hair, like kind of blonde hair. And I thought, well, what, who are these girls? Like, so, so the whole question then became, who are these girls and what is their relationship with each other? And gradually that's how I, again, start to piece together the whole story of, um, of Sorceress. And the other thing that I wanted right from the beginning was I've always wanted to do a punk rock club scene. So, so that was the other criteria was it had to have a punk rock club scene. So that evolved then gradually into that they were sisters. That took a long time to figure out and that they were coming to the city, the big city to see a concert. And this was their first time to come to the big city. And of course, you know, uh, it, it's, you know, that, so that's the, the, the thing. And then one of them gets kidnapped and that's the, you know, so that was the basics of the narrative, but I didn't set out at the beginning to say that it was all from images.
I mean, some of the films I do are abstract. So, you know, it's not like I'm always in narrative and certainly not always as, as a traditional a narrative as Sorceress and Labyrinth. But no, I like it. I think narrative, look, we tell stories to each other all the time. And the problem I think I was having a little bit was say something like experimental film back in the day was it was saying, no, no, no stories, no stories. And I was thinking, why? You know, why can we not tell stories? We tell each other stories all the time, right? And of course, and I, and I love um, fiction. I mean, again, The Arabian Nights, one of my favorite books, you know, Thousand and One Nights. People just telling stories endlessly, right? And so I wanted, that was also another quality that I wanted to bring to Sorceress. It's in Labyrinth as well, was this idea of stories inside of stories. So you start off, it looks like a normal trip to the big city and then things go bad, <laughs> badly awry. And then, <laughs> then she's got to find her sister. And, you know, and then they, you just start to wander into weirder and weirder things. Actually, things that are quite improbable that couldn't actually happen in a city. And uh, I won't say what they are, but... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah no i think uh narrative is is really great it's it's it it's um a journey i don't but i don't necessarily want to make them normal i i want to make them have little weird bits but i don't want the weird bits to be everything so i don't want you to just go to the theater like what the heck was that you know i want it to be what you know gee that what what was that but <laughs> and this was interesting you know there, and i think there's a bit of a difference you know so it's not like i'm saying i'm against abstract i'm just going in the in the way that i that interests me because i have made abstract films but but one thing that someone reminded me of just a couple of years ago was that actually abstract painting comes from surrealism it comes from the idea of how do we depict our dreams how do we depict the insides of ourselves and so that's an interesting thing. It's, 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 we've kind of forgotten it. You know, I think for a while painting, abstract painting was discussed as, oh, it's just paint on canvas. And just that whole, you know, we're seeing an illusion in, a, in paint on canvas. But actually it came out of trying to describe more abstract states. And I think just to bring it full circle with the narratives I'm working on, there's some very abstract notions like the afterlife in, lab, in Labyrinth. Where you know you actually see someone dies and their soul at least to me it wasn't apparent to everybody else their their soul leaves their body and and, they, and it turns into an eye right and uh, you know th this all-seeing eye and um, for me this was just the life energy going out of the people right and that's kind of an abstract notion right? you know but here's the thing <laughs> when you get into say making an abstract film which I, i've also made abstract abstract films you get into the, the the issue of what is pulling, what is taking us through the film. So if, if it's not a story, what is it that's that's taking us through the movie? Uh, with with interview, which was was actually a commission piece. Um, it what what happened was the Toronto Animated Image Society had gotten money to uh, commission eleven animators to pick one of the one of the members of the Painters 11, which was a group of abstract expressionist painters in Toronto in the late 50s, early 60s. And I chose uh, Kazuo Nakamura, who was a, a Japanese-Canadian uh, painter. I loved his work since I was in high school. And so it was great. It was just like, you know, and I had gone to two retrospectives of his. And, uh, and I had the catalogs. I had all the paintings and everything. And initially what we were supposed to do in that project was pick one painting. And the whole film would be based on one painting. We all had to animate something. And then, uh, but then, uh, then it became kind of, it, we kind of lose, everything kind of loosened up a little bit. And it could be about their whole work, their whole body of work. And I thought, okay, well, that's great. Fine. If I can choose all my favorite Nakamura paintings, <laughs> then, you know, then that's great. I, I, I'm sad, right? But then it became, became the question is, how do you animate this? Because if you think like of a Jackson Pollock, or, or in the case of Nakamura, his paintings were made out of thousands and thousands of little tiny calligraphic brush strokes. So how, what, what would I do? How could I, you know, make all this come to life? So, and then I also wanted to kind of, I've always, I guess, cause have, I've made documentaries on artists. Uh, you know, I did one on a poet, one on a uh, animator and uh, one on a sculptor. And I'm always, I was always trying to contextualize them for people, let, let them people where, where this was coming from. It just isn't, 
it just is in weird stuff. It's actually coming from very specific concerns, usually from that person's autobiography. Uh, you know, and this this is true. You know, I, it's always in the biography, right? So anyway, so in case of Nakamura, he was he was um, he was an abstract painter. But when you look at his work, he loved science. He loved nature. He read Scientific America, like religiously. So a lot of his paintings were actually trying to depict molecular structures or the design of the, the universe. Like, you know, the, the design of what things look like at a molecular level or in a physics level. So I thought, and, and so I, I thought what I would do to, to go through the film was to bracket it, start it off with nature. So you see like reeds blowing in the wind, the sound of chimes, a drop of water and the, the, the ripple effect that looks like sound coming out of it. And then boom, you go into his world. Now, how was I going to animate the paintings? Okay, well, I figured out how to do that. <laughs> what I thought I was do is I'll just paint them myself underneath the camera and stop every couple of brush strokes and take a picture, right? And that way, you, the painting, you don't see my hands or the paintbrush, but it comes to life as, as you're watching it. The painting is literally built in front of you. So there, that kind of solved the whole issue of how do you you had to sort of you, you sort of seduce the people into his world, and then see you see where this abstraction is actually coming from, and then come back out to nature again. So that's the way I solved it in that case. <laughs> but it is a tough thing with abstract imagery because sometimes it loses its connection with where it's come from. In in Nakamura's case, uh, nature. The other film we could talk about is Amoeba, which. Um, came about, it was an interesting uh, situation I found myself in. I was between projects. I was waiting to get some money for a bigger film, which became Sorceress. And it was funny. It was one of those times you go as an artist because it's a, it's a crazy life. You say, well, maybe I should get a job. <laughs> and But then there was a lot of me, a lot of inside of me that was kind of like really was not angry, but just maybe had lots of energy inside me. And I've always loved uh, the, uh, the, uh, the music of a musician from New York called John Zorn. And uh, I like his film, his music. Uh, uh, you know, he, he goes through styles like crazy. Uh, he, he, he likes all styles. He, you know, so maybe this idea of working in abstract and working in narrative comes from him. But uh, so I thought, you know, I'd really, there was one piece of music I had. Uh, I loved his Masada project, which is basically a, Klezmer meets jazz kind of band, four piece band. And there was this, but all the pieces are really long and I needed something really short. And there's one piece called uh, Shilam that's about two, two, two and a half, no, two minutes. And uh, I, and I said to my musician, I didn't think John Zorn would let me use this because I didn't know him. And I, and I said to my musician, you know, if I, if I animate it to this piece of music, could you put another piece of music <laughs> at the end? And he said, oh no, why don't you just, you know, ask him if you can use it, right? And so I, I emailed his uh, publisher, and and <laughs> and the next morning I had an email from him, <laughs> and uh, he, and I and he said, "Well, what do you want?" And I said, "Well, I want to use your your music in an in an abstract animated film." And uh, like ten minutes later, he said, "Okay, fine." <laughs> and it was just. You know, go for it. And um, so so I, I thought, fine, okay, now the music's, <laughs> the whole issue of the music settled. And, <laughs> and I just started at the beginning of the film and went to the end. And what I liked about uh, the, the piece, Shillam, the actual piece of music called Shillam, that he wrote was, it was very aggressive. It was like, it was klezmer on speed. It was just like, da 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 And um, it actually had a, not a three act. Yeah, it was a three act structure. It was. It would sort of go. It would do. It would do sort of a repetition, then end, and then start again and do that end, and then it go into a this crazy free form section, where the 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 soloing just lost, uh, you know, touch with with musical notes at all. It was like, you know, this you know, and I just loved. It. I thought this is nuts, you know, and then it would go back to the theme again, and this is what is always great about his music. He's a, has such a solid melodic structure that when they go into a free form section, they can come back out and just hit the beat and be right back into the. Uh, so he and he, he's a fascinating uh, uh, filmmaker. Uh, no, well, I was going to say filmmaker. He he likes films a lot, 
and he's thought about film a lot and and a lot of his inspiration are film um film soundtracks film uh, composers and uh but he he's really uh taken collage in 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 sound in music to a whole other level where he'll he'll do very abrupt turns which you shouldn't even be able to do you know and so you're going really fast then you just stop and all of a sudden you go slow you know and just like that and it's not a, a, a cut it's actually live he does it live right so i found his work really fascinating so anyway so that gave me the structure for amoeba it was just okay now i can now i've got the soundtrack i just have to stay in <laughs> i have to try to stay up with this piece of music <laughs> which actually it took me about two and a half months of animating to, to, to finish the, the two and a half minute piece and that's how i did it it was just based on the music and in that case the music just takes you by the back of the neck and drags you through the film it's it's that propulsive a, a piece of music and um and it was a funny thing it was also a film where i was trying not to animate on a certain level like i was more interested in uh chance in in like the way john cage would be interested in chance so a lot of the animation I would just sort of do and then try to figure out where it fit in the the, the thing. I wasn't like I was saying I would, I would listen to like a little second and go, okay, now it's got to be this here. I, sometimes I would make something it wouldn't fit, so I just move it to somewhere else. But a lot of the times the animation wasn't even animating. I would just paint something six times and then alternate those frames. When you think of yourself as going to grow up and be a painter, you don't think you think of yourself as being alone doing your paintings, so that's the kind of practice I come from. It's not it's not from having hundreds of people and coordinating crews and all this other stuff. You just want the privacy, the the personal experience of painting. And the nice thing about painting on glass is it's painting, but then also making the painting come to life. 